All right, y'all ready to get into the Word tonight? Amen. This is How to Create a Better Life, Part 12. How about hand me one of those, Brother Ralph? Part 12, and the subtitle is The Power of the Mind. I want you to turn your Bible with me, please, to Acts 20, and we're going to read verse 22. Thank you. Acts 20, verse 32. Now, Paul here is having a minister's meeting with all of the pastors, with all the ministers, before he is about to sail to, uh, and of course a lot of things happen between the end of the time he stood before Caesar, but he tells them, you're never going to see my face again, and he has a lot of things to share with them before he leaves. And he says to him in verse 32, and now brethren, I commend to you, you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified, all them that are saved, all them that are set apart by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Listen to me. There are people that will tear you down. There are preachers that will tear you down. Anything, anyone that is tearing you down, you need to separate yourself from that. Understand that God in his word is given to us to build us up. When the Apostle Paul was talking about the nine gifts of the Spirit, and as much as there are people who desire the gifts of the Spirit to manifest in their life, he goes on in those two chapters of 1 Corinthians in 12 and 14. He says, but more than anything else, he said, desire for that the body will be edified. Desire that the body will be built up. That's what that edify means, to build up. That's where the word edifice, a building, comes from, that Greek word. God wants the body to be built up. The whole purpose of teaching and preaching the word of his grace is to build you up spiritually, mentally, physically, your family, relationships, financially, in every way. That's the whole purpose of it. Amen? And as we go into this tonight, I want you to remember the last thing that we were talking about. We were, I told you, I said, we're going to take a real deep dive into the mind. And as we're starting in that tonight to go deeper, okay? And I want you to remember, I told you the soul is made up of the mind, the will, the emotions. When you were born again, your spirit man was recreated in the image of God. In the same way that God created Adam and Eve in the garden, the Bible says he created them in his image, in his likeness. I want you to understand there's no difference. When you are born again, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.24 that you're to put on that new man, which after God is created in his likeness and in righteousness and in true holiness. I mean, you're created in the image of God. And it's our responsibility to put that new man on. The whole purpose of this teaching that we're doing is to help you to understand how to put off the old man, according to Ephesians 4.22, and how to put on the new man, verse 24. In the middle, it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So when a person is born again, their spirit is literally recreated. That's the reason the Bible says he becomes a new creature, right? I remember the night that I was born again. I was as different as day is from night. I'm telling you, God changed my life so much, but yet my mind was still messed up in a lot of ways. My body still needed to be brought into submission. The body and the mind still had to be dealt with. And the Bible instructs us how to deal with both. The problem with a lot of Christians is they got saved and they never dealt with their mind. They never dealt with their body. And if you have been listening, you know by now that anything left to itself tends toward chaos. I mean, it just gets crazier and crazier. So you cannot allow your mind to think the way it always did. Your body should still have its way the way it always did before. Okay. Number one, on your handout, God made man to operate out of his spirit. However, most people operate out of their soul. Um, 
You know, the Bible says that if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. The Scriptures tell us in Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 20, 27, if you're taking notes, the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. He doesn't say the soul of man. He doesn't say the body of man. There are religions that teach that God is a mind. God is not a mind. Jesus himself in John 4, 24 said God is a spirit, yeah. right? Paul prayed that we would be sanctified completely spirit, soul, and body. Man is a spirit being who has a soul and he lives in a body. That soul is made up of his mind, his will, and his emotions. Now the Bible tells us you've got to deal with your body. Paul said, I put my body under, right? Right? In other words, I put my body under the control of my spirit. We're to be operating out of our spirit, not operating out of our soul, not operating from the flesh. The Holy Spirit spoke to me one time, and he said, live life from the inside out. Now, there's a big difference in living life from the outside in and inside out. Okay? When you're living life from the inside out, you are operating out of your spirit. Not out of here, not from the flesh, not allowing your body to control you, but your spirit is being led by the Holy Spirit. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now what you may not know, when you are reading in the New Testament, you see that word sons, it is not always the same Greek word. There are two different words. One of them is simply a reference to a son who has been born to a man and woman. He's a child. The other one is a reference to a full-grown son. When Paul says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, he said they are the mature, full-grown son. There are a lot of Christians that don't know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to learn to listen to that still, small voice of your spirit on the inside, and that's being led by the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to get into that in no great detail right now. But remember, God created Adam from the very beginning to operate out of his spirit. Your spirit is what receives revelation. Not your mind, not your body, but it's your spirit, the hidden man of the heart, the inward man. Those are two phrases that you find in the New Testament that Paul and Peter used. The inward man of the heart, okay? He says that that man is an invisible man. You can't see him with your physical eyes. That man is the one that is born again. That man is the one where God dwells inside, in his spirit. And with your spirit, you're led. You're guided. So don't ever forget that. God wants you to operate out of your spirit. Paul, I mean, Adam... Before he sinned, he was operating 100% totally out of his spirit, not controlled by emotions, not controlled by his body. Folks, he didn't even know he was naked until after he sinned. Once he fell into sin, now he's not operating on revelation. He's being totally controlled by his senses. And the Bible says that the just, those that have been made righteous, walk by faith and not by sight, not by their physical senses. Amen? God wants you to be built up. And the one way you're going to get built up, the number one way you're going to get, get built up, is to get the Word of God in your heart, in your mind, and in your mouth. Okay? I said a lot of people operate out of their souls, right? Well, let's just say, for example, something bad happens. And immediately, they are affected emotionally. How many of you can honestly say that there's been bad things to happen in your life and you got emotional? Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. I'm sure everybody here has had something bad to happen and you became emotional. But what if you could train your spirit to the point that you absolutely refused, even though you felt the emotions, even though the emotions were there, but you absolutely refused to allow your emotions to control you. See, we get emotional at times. 
You hear certain messages. Several of you at Mother's Day got emotional. I even got emotional. There's nothing wrong with emotions. As long as I don't allow the emotion to control me. God gave us those emotions. All right? I mean, you don't want to walk around just hard, cold, you know, never showing any, any kind of emotion. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't allow the, commo the emotion to rob you of using your authority, of claiming your rights, because we just read, he said that the word of God's grace is able to build you and give you an inheritance. There's a rightful inheritance that belongs to each and every one of us as children of God. Number two, emotions travel 80,000 times faster than thoughts. That's the reason, usually, people respond to their emotions before they ever even stop to think about what am I going to do next? What am I going to say next? They immediately respond to their emotions. Does it have to be that way? And that's why most people are affected more by their emotions than they are their principles or what they believe. True story, I read several years ago, this couple that attended the Word of Faith Church, good church down in Florida, one of them was a one of the a couple, I can't remember if it was a man or a woman, one of them was a doctor, and the other one was something else, professional. They had a little child, and uh, one day they suddenly realized that the child was hadn't been seen in quite a while, and they ran outside. The child is floating in the pool. They drug him out. He was dead. They checked no pulse, no sign of life whatsoever. One of them began to fall apart, crying and screaming. The other one grabbed him and said, shut up. Amen. Now is not the time to fall apart. Now is the time to use everything that we've been taught and everything we believe about God and his word and our authority. And began to rebuke death and commanded life into that child's body. Long story short, the child lived, had no brain damage, no problem. Doctors were absolutely amazed. It was a miracle. But it didn't just happen, okay, because it was just God's will. If it hadn't have been God's will, it wouldn't happen. No, 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 no. It was God's will for that child to live. But that child didn't live just because it was God's will. Because God's will is not automatic. It's because somebody stopped the emotion from taking over, and instead they operated out of their spirit to do what the Word of God teaches us to do. Amen? Amen. Number three, emotions affect the will. The will affects the mind, and the mind affects the actions. That's the reason, folks, that unrenewed minds wreak havoc in a person's life. Unrenewed minds, I'm telling you, uh, is a terrible thing to have. Now, you know as well as I do, if a person ever loses their will to live, even doctors say that's half the battle right there. Half the battle is having the will. If, if they ever lose their will to live, but why do they lose their will to live? I've known them case after case after case after case because their emotions are affected by what they hear from the doctors and the tests they see and the symptoms in the body and the pain and everything else they feel. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not accusing anybody because when you're in that situation, it's hard. Okay? But yet all things are possible to those that believe. And so the emotions affect the will of a person, and then, of course, the will affects the mind, and the mind affects their actions, what they choose to do after that. Number four, the mind is made up of two aspects, the conscious and the subconscious. There is the conscious mind, and there is the subconscious mind. And for those who have deep emotional problems, I want you to listen very, very carefully. I want you to take this home with you, and I want you to study it, and I want you to pray over it, and I want you to write out confessions concerning things that you're going to hear tonight. I couldn't put everything on the handout. I got the jest just right front, back, everywhere you have to, okay? 
But I do want you to get some certain things to have a good understanding. The job, number five, the job of the conscious mind is to analyze new information. You've heard me say it. People come in here, they hear things for the first time they've never heard before. Your conscious mind takes something that you've never heard before. It's new to you. Whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in a church setting or whatever, the job of the conscious mind is to analyze any new information that you get. Now, what it does, it takes that new information, it compares it to the current information that it already has, and then it determines truth for your life. Now, let's say, for example, let me, let me put it like this. The problem with that, is if you grew up and through a lot of wrong teaching and training and experiences, the conscious mind has accepted beliefs that are contrary to the Word of God, what it's going to do is going to produce the wrong responses, like that person that fell apart when the child was in drug out of the pool. And those wrong responses are going to limit you and they're going to prevent you from growing in corresponding areas of where you want to grow. For example, when I say corresponding areas, let's just take the subject of healing. What was you taught growing up concerning divine healing? What did you believe concerning divine healing? What did your parents believe? What did the church teach that you grew up in? If you was like in a church where my wife grew in, grew up in, most of them would say, uh, well, we know that God can, right? If it's his will, therefore nobody was ever healed because they didn't know whether it was his will or not. They told me, the first church that I pastored, they told me that God doesn't heal that way anymore through the laying on of hands. He only uses doctors and medicine. Thank God for doctors and medicine. But yet the word of God is true. See, you've got to ask yourself, when I was growing up, and through my formative years and on into my adult life, what was I taught? What was I hearing? What did I believe in my heart of hearts about divine healing? Does God use a man to heal? Will God heal through the laying on of hands? A lot of people say, no, I don't believe that. So when they hear new information, let's just say that person comes in here for the first time and I preach a message on divine healing, their conscious mind takes that information, compares it to the current information and what they've always believed, analyzes it, and then tries to tell them the truth when actually their conscious mind is lying to them. Yeah. <coughs> what about speaking in tongues? Let me tell you what I heard about speaking in tongues growing up. I heard... Speaking in tongues is the devil. How many heard that? I was told, stay away from people that speak in tongues. I was told there are, they called them holy rollers. The folks that I knew called them holy rollers. Those people are crazy. It's of the devil. Yeah, that's everything I heard about speaking in tongues was negative. And even when I got saved, listen to me, when I got saved and started going to church, the first people that I talked to, they said the same thing. They told me the same thing. I tell my even preachers would tell me the same thing. But yet, listen to me, you're going to learn. I overcame every bit of that by doing what I'm teaching you in this series. Okay? You know, the first time, now I had been saved for a while. The, and had been preaching. And the first time that I heard a man preach a message on financial prosperity. My wife will tell you if she remembers it. We were sitting there listening, and uh, my mind was going, boing, 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 I don't know about this, you know, like alarms going off. What's happening? My conscious mind that had heard my dad and my uncles and others say, all preachers want is your money. You ought not be talking about money in church. Money is the root of all evil. You know, I did not know that money is not the root of all evil until after I got saved and started reading my Bible. 
Now, I'd heard a lot of people misquote the Bible. Because the Bible says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Not money. Money itself is not good or bad. It's how you use it. All right? See, a lot of people, I don't care what subject you want to talk about. They have, most people have preconceived ideas about it. They have their own opinions and beliefs already formed inside them in their personal belief system when they hear the truth for the first time. And at that point is when you have a choice, either you're going to be smart enough. You know, my, my, fir my first pastor, when I went to him after getting saved and they gave me the Bible and I'm reading it, you know, you know, you know, you all know the story. So when I get to the book of Acts and I read about speaking in tongues, now I got a bunch of questions. My pastor had enough sense to tell me, he said, Eddie, he said, I, I'm just going to tell you the honest truth. I do not know enough about it to say yay or nay. I can't speak for it, but I can't speak against it. Well, thank God he had enough sense to say that, right? Amen. Amen. But almost every other preacher that I asked about it told me all that same old stuff. Of the devil, stay away from them people, they're crazy, blah, 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 you know. Same old, same old things. Well, when I heard that man preach that message on prosperity, I basically told my wife, I said, you know what, I'm going to find out if this is true or not. Because I jotted down. He was, he, was, he was backing it up with the Bible. I just wanted to make sure he wasn't twisting it. Because see, that's what a lot of people do. They take the Word of God and they twist it to their own destruction. When you take what you believe based on your conscious mind has always accepted things, beliefs, listen to me, that are contrary to God's Word, what you are doing is you are allowing that word to be twisted to destroy your own health, your own financial prosperity, your own blessings, your own victory. That's what's happening. So I just said, I'm going to study it. I'm going to find out. And I did. Week after week after week after week. I just studied and I dug every scripture I could. And you know what I came, my conclusion was? God wants his people to be blessed financially. He wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be blessed so we can be a blessing. Hallelujah. But most people won't do that. I told y'all that story about that guy, and I don't have time to go into great detail, about that couple that, that uh, got saved about the same time I did. And he was called to preach. I was called to preach. They went separate ways. Many years later, she calls and apologizes to me. Because now she and her husband both have experienced divine healing in their bodies. But she apologized. She said, because we thought you were a nut. They heard the same things I heard. They were hearing the same thing that I was hearing. The only problem was they wouldn't accept it. Their conscious mind was analyzing all this new information and wouldn't accept it. And telling them, no, this is what's true. You know, what your mom and dad taught you, what the old church taught you. This is what's true. Well, they found out that was all a lie, okay? Number six, we have an unlimited gospel. Yet many Christians live a limited life because of an unrenewed mind. An unrenewed mind. I'm going to tell you all something. If you did not get to hear Sunday's message, I really want you to go back and listen to it. Because not this Sunday, of course, I won't be preaching, but the following Sunday, we're getting right back on it. Because I'm telling you, this thing is so powerful. God has revealed to me that there are very, very, very few Christians who have a really, truly renewed mind and is truly speaking the language of faith in their everyday life. Number seven. And I'm just telling you, that's the reason a lot of people, there, they are limiting God. It's like Psalm 78, 41. The children of Israel, they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited God. A lot of people say, oh, you can't put limits on God. Well, you read it for yourself. It says they limited the Holy One of Israel. It was God's will for them to go into the promised land. Did they all go? No. Why did they not enter into that place? Because of unbelief. Their unbelief limited God. In Mark 6, 5, put Mark 6, 5. I know I've quoted this several times. But I want y'all to see this in Mark 6, 5. Jesus, now he had gone back to uh, 
Nazareth where he grew up. And the Bible says, and he could there do no mighty work. It doesn't say he wouldn't. How I many you know he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power in Nazareth just as he was in Capernaum anywhere else? But here he couldn't do any mighty works. The Greek says he healed a few with minor ailments. He laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. The cure, he went about teaching. That's the cure for unbelief is teaching. And if people will hear and believe, if they will have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, the unbelief can be cured. And listen, I want you to realize that people still are limiting what God can do in their life. If Jesus couldn't heal there, what makes us think that we can bring healing to anybody where there's uh, just a ton of unbelief. Y'all, right. there were times when Jesus would actually put everybody else out of the room before he ministered to somebody. One time, he took the guy out of, outside the city limits. There was so much doubt and unbelief in that town, he took him outside the city limits to heal him. Don't tell me you can't limit God. And the gospel is unlimited. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, God wants you to have it all. Amen. When I say have it all, I'm talking about salvation, healing, deliverance, blessing, victory, joy, peace, righteousness, goodness. He wants you to have it all. And until you receive that in your heart, you're not going to have it all. Number seven, the job of the subconscious mind is to make come to pass what your conscious mind determines is true. Y'all see that? It's working to make come to pass what your conscious mind determines is true. So, if your conscious mind hears a new truth and says, I don't receive that based on all the information that I've had for the last 30 years, I don't receive that. That's different. That's totally different from everything that your mama believed and your pastor growing up believed. Your family believed. So your subconscious mind begins to work to make come to pass what your conscious mind determines is true. It's kind of like the, the subconscious mind, imagine it like a real big uh, data bank. I mean, it's just filled with all this information where every thought, every idea, every emotion, every experience, everything you've ever been taught and heard is recorded. Just think about that for a moment. The subconscious mind is able to record every single event in your life, every experience, everything you've heard, everything you've ever been told, everything you've ever read. It's all stored in that subconscious part of you. It does not reason whatsoever. It simply works in conjunction with your conscious mind. Um. Kind of put it like this in everyday language. They're working in cahoots to keep you locked into your past. Your subconscious mind works in conjunction with your conscious mind based on what your conscious mind has received and determined to be true, whether it's true or not, works together to keep you locked into that, what you were taught what you believed in the past before you were exposed to the truth. When Jesus was talking about things being rooted up, he was talking about beliefs. Go back and read Matthew 15 for yourself. Read those first several verses. And you will find that he told them that they had actually taken the traditions of men they had turned them into doctrines and taught them. And he said, and now, he said, every plant that was not planted, every doctrine, every belief that was not planted by my heavenly Father must be rooted out. He said, because the tradition has now robbed the Word of God of having any force or effect in your life. Isn't that sad? Happens all the time. 
You would not believe through the years that people have told me. Yeah, but here's the way I, I believe it. And they tell you, and it's not even in the Bible. One man told Brother Hagin, well, what I'm, what I'm going to teach you, what I'm going to tell you is beyond the Bible. You won't find this in the Bible. Well, you know they're in trouble then. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, every single one of us has a self-image. I want you to think about it for a moment. You have a self-image. I have a self-image. It's the way that you think of yourself. It's how you see yourself. I wish there was a, that you could sit down and be honest, totally honest with yourself and write it out. This is what I think about myself. This is how I see myself. Because then you would have something to work with and understand the changes that you have to make. Do you see yourself as significant or insignificant? Are you important or not? A lot of people, they don't even think they're important to this church. And I have stressed, and my wife is stressed, Milton, Josh, everybody. We have stressed over and over and over through the years. There's a place for everybody. We need everybody. Uh, God loves everybody the same. God's love is unconditional. There's something for everybody to do. There's a place for you to get connected. But yet, it's a bunch of people. Undoubtedly, they don't feel needed. For some reason, they don't feel important. They don't feel they have anything to offer. But see, God wants you to begin to see yourself as he sees you. That self-image is an invisible picture that you carry around with you all the time. You can't reach in your wallet, your purse, and pull it out and look at it. All you got to do is think about yourself, and there it is. It's in front of you. You see yourself. Now, I know that the Bible says that we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. It, we all know those people. They think they're all that, right? We all know them. They think they know everything. You can't tell them anything because they know everything, right? There, I have been around those people when I knew that I knew more about the subject at hand than they did but I didn't even try to say anything because they know it all. They would never ask you your opinion of something. They would never ask you for any information because they already have it. And if you don't believe me, just ask them. Okay? Now listen to me. The, this this self-image is so important. See, the subconscious mind has created habits and comfort zones in people's lives. In most areas of your life, in my life, the subconscious mind has created habits and comfort zones in our personal belief system. That's the reason I was rocked when I heard that message the first time on financial prosperity. That same evangelist called a young man out of the congregation and prophesied to him that God had anointed him to make money for the kingdom of God. And my mind is sitting here going, whoa, what in the world is he talking about? Because I've never heard anything like that before. See, folks, it's all about consistency. It's all about keeping you in that comfort zone. As I was praying and asking the Lord, help me, I want to be able to explain this in a way that people can really grasp it. And he gave me this, this idea, this thought. It's kind of like, because most of you here are more techie than I am. I am not techie at all. Ask my family and Josh if you don't believe me. Uh, but most of you probably know a little bit about a computer. And uh, the computer programming has a default system built into it. It's a pre-selected option, for example. Let's just take the font. The font that you like to use or want to use, right? Most computer programming has a default font built into it 
And if you do not choose another alternative, it automatically reverts to that preselected option, to that default. That's how this works. Every one of us has a default. When we don't know the truth, when we don't choose an alternative, our subconscious mind immediately defaults back to what we'd always heard, what we'd always believed. Okay? Now, if you want to change the default, you can change it, and it's going to take some work, because I read upon it today. It takes new programming. The same is true for the subconscious mind. Number 11, without new programming, when violated, where, where am I at? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Number eight, your subconscious mind works to make sure your words and actions stay in line with your self-image. I told you it creates habits, comfort zones, consistency. See, that's the reason why you don't have to learn the same things over and over and over like riding a bike. Y'all have always heard that phrase, it's like riding a bike, right? Why is that? Because if you ever learn to ride a bike, it may be 30 years later, you can still ride a bike. You don't have to learn it again. Stay with me now. The subconscious mind is working to make sure that your words, your actions stay in line with your self-image. How many of you remember that from the very start I told you that this series is about renewing the mind, establishing the heart, and changing your personal belief system? Y'all remember that? Number nine, the, self, the subconscious mind creates an automatic response system which is where your personal belief system exists, an automatic response system. You respond automatically a certain way. You say certain things. You think certain things. You do certain things. Automatic response system. Every one of us has it. When something doesn't go the right way, how do you respond? Do you respond differently now with your words, with your thoughts, with your action than you did before you started sitting up under the Word? If you haven't been paying attention, have you ever noticed these people? Now, most preachers are going to say, well, they were not really truly saved. I don't agree with that. They're just carnal Christians. They get mad. They hit the finger with a hammer. They cuss. That's their default system. That's your automatic response system at work. Okay? But after spending time in the Word, listen to me, getting your mind renewed, getting it on the inside, digging up the old roots, what happens? All of a sudden, you say, mm, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I rebuke that pain in Jesus' name. I command that bleeding to stop in Jesus' name. Well, you've grown some, haven't you, when that happens. Hallelujah. Now, psychologists say that 90 to 95% of your daily decisions come out of your, not your conscious mind, but your subconscious mind. 90 to 95% of the decisions that you make on a daily basis are automatic. They come out of your subconsciousness without you even giving thought to it. That's what spiritual warfare is all about, people. You get to choose what you're going to think about. You get to choose what you're going to meditate on, what you are going to allow yourself to think and to say and to do. Amen? Amen. See, if you grew up properly trained, now I know we got some families in the church that since the time their children were born, they've been speaking the word over them. They've been teaching them the word. They've disciplined them. They've loved them. They've had them under the word. They've had them under the anointing. They've been properly trained in word and thought and in action. Their conscious mind, now listen to me, told their 
subconscious mind, the tr listen to me, truth that is productive. Everything's fine if that's true. Okay? Because, see, now the, the conscious mind and subconscious mind is in agreement. Are oh, you hearing me? There's no argument between the two. Because from the day that they were born, they were told by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. How many of you remember when Josh and Rebecca did that teaching on the household of faith? And they had the family rules and everything. And they were talking about when the kids, you know, growing up. And they still got little younger kids even now, even though they got one that's grown, another that's almost grown. And they were talking about when, when the child woke up and said they were sick or whatever, you know. Oh, no. No, no, you're not sick by the stripes of Jesus. You were healed. Amen. So they've grown up that way all their life. They were, they were never, they never ever said we can't afford this and we can't afford that and talking about how bad things are and all this because of being properly trained in thought, word, and deed. Well, now their, their, their conscious mind and their subconscious mind is in agreement. But on the other hand, if you grew up like me or if you grew up even like my wife who grew up in a good family and, a, and, a, and, a, and in church all the time, but she'd be the first one to tell you a lot of those things that she was taught when she faced the truth of it for the first time. Y'all heard her last week when she went to the church first time. They were lifting their hands. She went home and asked, why are they waving at Jesus? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. There's the clash right there. The clash between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Her conscious mind saw something, heard something for the first time, and it created some confusion between that and what was on the inside of her personal belief system. What was embedded on the inside. Okay? Now, it's possible that you may have some beliefs contrary to God's Word on the inside of you in your personal belief system. It's possible that you may have developed some characteristics that are not in line with God's nature. I mean that God is love. It is not the nature of God to curse and put your fist through the wall. It is not the nature of God to scream and holler at your husband or wife or your children and blame them for everything that's going wrong in your life. That's not the nature of God. But yet, there's a lot of Christians that are that way. They've been saved. They say they love the Lord. But they're going to miss out on a lot in this life because you have to be willing to make the necessary changes. Because what happens is these, these contrary beliefs and characteristics and all that, they continue to work to produce the wrong responses and the wrong actions, and they prevent us from growing in these corresponding areas of healing and deliverance and peace and joy Competence and trust and all this. That's the reason you've got to make sure I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to speak the word. If I have to put tape on my mouth, I'm going to speak the word. I'll just take it off long enough just to say the word and put it back. <laughs> Amen? Let me, let me explain this in very simple terms. How many of you remember learning to drive? Raise your hand if you remember learning to drive. Did any of you ever learn to drive a straight shift? Huh? Do you remember those days? Everything was done with your conscious mind. Everything was very mechanical from the steering wheel to the gear shift to the brake to the gas pedal. Everything. You're looking. You're looking down. You can't look down and drive. And whoever was teaching you told you, quit looking at your feet. You got to look up. Because you're trying to figure out the pedals. You got your clutch. You got your brake. You got your gas pedal. And you're trying very consciously, very mechanically to figure everything out. And you jerk and you jerk and you choke down. That's conscious. Okay? That's doing everything with your conscious mind. Well, then one day it becomes a learned procedure. It becomes a habit. Number 10 on your handout. Learning goes from a conscious level to a subconscious level. Okay? See, when you now are driving habitually, you're not even thinking about looking at anything. You've got the radio going. You've got your phone to your ear. I mean, you're doing three or four things at a time, and you're not even thinking about it because now you're doing it at a subconscious level. 
You've done it so long, it's become a habit. It's become a comfort zone. Now, y'all understand what I'm saying to you. Comfort zones are not always a bad thing. But they can be a bad thing to limit you and to prevent you from growing in the areas of life that you want to grow. Where you want to have increase in the love of God. Paul prayed that we would abound more and more in the love of God. I pray constantly that we would bound, abound. That I and that you, we would uh, abound more and more in the love of God. When you're abounding in the love of God, you don't look at somebody who walks in that's dirty and dressed poorly and turn your nose up at them and think, boy, I wish they wouldn't come here because they probably stink. That's not the love of God, right? God wants us to increase more and more in love and joy and peace in every area of our lives. When you lose the discomfort of the mechanical process, you pass on to a different level that is now subconsciously done. And you don't even give thought to it anymore. You know why? Because you have a default system. You have an automatic response system. The automatic response system can be good if it is trained properly. If it has the right Words, the right thoughts, which is God's, deposited into it. Let's take anger, for example. How many of you have ever had an anger problem? Raise your hand. Be honest. I'm not going to ask if you still do. I hope you don't. <laughs> I had a serious anger problem growing up. My dad had a violent temper. So, my brother and I, we had violent tempers as well. We learned to fight very early. We learned to survive by fighting. I had a terrible temper. And so I got saved. But you know what? I, because I'm reading my Bible, and I'm finding things like, well, Jesus is talking about turning the other cheek, and he's talking about loving your enemies, and, and all these things, and I'm looking at these things, and I'm like, surely he can't mean this. But yet, it was in there to walk in the love of God. Amen? And when people would attack me, I would feel my flesh. I mean, folks, y'all don't have to don't, I, I don't even want to get into the detail of it, okay? It was so bad. I would literally shake. I would get so mad, I would literally shake. And I'm just telling you right now, for people that knew me, uh, if I started shaking... Uh, they got out of the way. Either they were ready to fight or they got out of the way one. And when people started doing things and saying things, after I got saved, now i got to face up to something here. What am I going to do? Am I going to automatically revert back to my old way of handling things? That automatic response that used to run my life? Or am I going to change that? What well, I decided to change it. By choosing to walk in love. Was it easy? No. It's not easy. I'm going to be the first one to tell you. It is not easy. But all things are possible. Those that believe. Amen. Amen. You just got to make up your mind. I'm going to act on God's word. I'm going to live according to God's word. Amen. I want everything that God has for me. And nothing's going to stop me. Nothing's going to limit me. I'm not going to let anything prevent me from growing in these different areas of my life that I want to increase in. Now. Having said all that, remember what I said to you about that default system, just like on a computer, okay? You've got to do some reprogramming. Number 11, because my time's getting away from me. I've got to quickly move. Without new programming, when violated, the subconscious mind will work to keep you in your comfort zone. Your subconscious mind will work to keep you in that same rut, in that same place. That you've always been where it's limited, even though you know there's more. You've got to make up your mind to say, I want everything that God has for me. And nothing is going to stop me. Listen to me, the devil can't stop you. People can't stop you. God's on your side. He's for you. 
You're the only one that can stop yourself from increasing in every area of your life. You know, uh, this comfort zone. Remember I was talking to y'all earlier about set points and I referred to mindsets, self-limiting beliefs. They will literally sabotage any attempt to change the status quo. All those things that you were taught all your life growing up that are contrary to God's Word. All the things, thoughts that you have that are not God's thoughts. They don't agree with God's thoughts. All the words that you speak that are not in, in agreement with, God, with God's words. The actions that you take that are not in agreement with what God would have you to do. Every one of them will sabotage you from growing and increasing in financial prosperity, in divine health. And, and blessings in your marriage, and your family, your children. It's kind of like this. Now, now, Brant, he knows a little bit about flying. Who else knows something about flying in here? Anybody else knows something about flying? I've been in the, in the plane a lot of times. Josh has been in the plane a lot of times in the small planes and all, talking, listening, asking questions. So I know a little bit, you know, enough to talk about some things. But imagine for, let me show you how these set points, this mindset that I'm talking about works. These self-limiting beliefs. If you got in that plane and you get up there 25,000 feet and you put it on autopilot. Now you can take your hands off the controls and it will continue to fly at 25,000 feet. You can grab the controls. You can go up. You can go down. But as soon as you release the controls that plane will level back out at 25,000 feet. You know why? It's on autopilot. That's its default. Do you know anybody, don't point your finger, <laughs> that clams up when you get in an argument? Do you know anybody that blows up when you get in an argument, that's their default. That's what they've always done. That's what they're always going to do. When we are doing pre-marriage counseling, we usually will ask the people, because we're trying to help them to learn how to deal with marriage problems, because they're going to have problems. I guarantee it. I promise it. <laughs> they come in there all lubby dubby, you know, and act like, you know, they love each other, just want to eat each other, and we find out about a year later they wish they had ate each other, and, you know, <laughs> you gobble them down, you know. So we, we want them to wake up to reality. You're going to have fights. You're going to have fusses. You're going to have disagreements. So we always ask, what is your tendency when you get into an argument? And generally, one of them will say to clam up, and the other one will say to blow up. And we, of course, we tell them both is wrong. But why do they do that? They probably saw Mama do that or Daddy do that. That's what they've always done. That's the only thing they've ever known. It's built into them. Well, can that be changed? Huh? Well, so can anything else that is contrary to God's will, to God's word, to God's way, to God's nature, Anything can be changed, but it does take work. In other words, it takes reprogramming. You've got to make up your mind to spend time daily reprogramming yourself to get all of those wrong beliefs and thoughts out of you. Okay? Number 12, the subconscious mind must be renewed with God's truth in order to break the set points. You've got to break the set points. And the only way you can do it, is get the subconscious mind renewed. That's the reason I'm teaching you what I'm talking to you about on the language of faith. It has to become your daily conduct, your daily speech, your daily confession, what you say daily, what you say at home, what you say to your children, your husband, your wife, your boss at work, your friends, your co-workers. It's, it's what you say all the time. It's not something you say once in a while. See, now you can understand why 70% of lottery winners lose everything within five years or less. 
70%. And it doesn't make any difference whether they want a million or 500 million. 70% of all lottery winners in five years or less are right back where they were before they won that money. Think about it now. 95% of people who lose weight return to their original weight. Everybody say, not me. <laughs> Jesus, name. Y'all remember the halal of asterisis? Huh? The thing that was putting the pressure on, once it removed, everything goes back the way it was. So you've got to keep the pressure, the word, on the situation. Right? See, that's the reason I told y'all last week, you don't see things the way they are. You see things the way you are. Every one of us do. It's so important that we see ourselves the way God does. Number 13, your subconscious mind works to keep you aligned with how your self-image perceives itself. Have you ever been driving down the road and something don't feel right? Your car's pulling to the right, it's filled, pulling to the left. Maybe you feel a little bump in the tire, whatever. And it's just, you just know something ain't right, you know? So you take it to the shop. And they say, you've got to have a front end alignment. Right? Why? Because if you don't, it's not going to fix itself. You hear me? If you ignore it, it's going to get worse. People who ignore marriage problems are setting themselves up for a great downfall. You've got to make up your mind. You know what? I am going to train myself to see myself the way God sees me. I am going to work on what is wrong. I'm going to get it fixed. You know, one time, several years ago, I was walking with a left tilt. I mean, literally, I could look in the mirror and I could see myself a little tilted, like this right here. And so I called this Christian uh, couple, their chiropractors up in Charlotte, and I made an appointment. And I didn't tell her, I just made an appointment with the secretary, you know, the receptionist. And when I walked in, she looked at me, she said, you're walking tilted. And I said, I know, that's reason I'm here. I needed an adjustment. Amen. You know, like that car needed that front end alignment. So she said, lay down on that table. And when I got up, I walked perfectly straight. Now, I don't know whether she did a front end alignment or rear end alignment or what she did. <laughs> but when I got up, everything was aligned. That's all I'm telling you. God wants to help you to get everything lined up yeah. with his word, with his way, with his will, with his character. Amen. Now listen, the wrong perception of self is the reason that a lot of sales reps can't break a certain number barrier. Years and years ago, I worked for the Macon Telegraph newspaper. I had not been there long at all. I was a uh, district manager. And so I had like five or six counties, and they were the most far-reaching um, rural districts that the Macon Telegraph had. And... Uh, which had the lowest circulation because they were so far removed. There was other t uh, cities like Albany that had, uh, you know, a, a, a daily paper as well that was closer to my area than Macon was. Well, I hadn't been there long, and they announced we're going to have our annual sales contest. And the person who sells the most new subscriptions wins the Green Jacket Award. Just like the Masters, they give you a green jacket. We, uh, they, get, they had a trip to uh, Atlanta to stay in the uh, Peachtree Hotel, the one that's got the, you know, the revolving thing with the restaurant on top. Plaza. Huh? Plaza. Yeah, the Plaza. Baseball games with the Braves that weekend. And a big chunk of money. Well, I'm new there. And everybody starts telling me immediately. Everybody there. They said, don't even, don't, don't even think twice about it. I said, why? He said, because so-and-so... He has a district here in the city of Macon. He has a great big van. He has a crew of boys and girls that sell subscriptions for him. Nobody's ever beat him. They call him the general, and you cannot beat him. I said, watch me. And guess who won the green jacket? And guess who spent the weekend in Atlanta going to Braves baseball game, eating at the Revolving Plaza restaurant on top of the hotel, and got the check? But see, they believed, the rest of them, they believed they couldn't beat him, so they, they didn't. Amen? Amen? When we came here, God told me, I want you to break two barriers. The, the 100 cap, 
He said, because hardly any of the churches have uh, 100 people in them. Most of them, 50, 40, 30, whatever. He said, I want you to break the cap. And guess what? We broke that. And he said, I want you to break the racial barrier through prayer and preaching the word. And y'all remember how that happened. A black lady said she was going down this road in her car. She was supposed to turn left. Her car turned to the right and then pulled into the parking lot. She said, I figured, well, Lord, you must want me to go in there. <laughs> Amen. Number 14, your thinking at the subconscious level creates comfort zones that affect your destiny. Has any of you ever heard of a man by the name of Roger Bannister? I'm going to finish with this story. The year was 1953. No runner had ever broke the four-minute mile. Never, never. Nobody had ever run it under four minutes. As a matter of fact, it was thought to be entirely impossible by the entire track industry. They said it could not be done. That was the mindset of the day. It can't be done. But Roger Bannister believed that it could be done. So he started training. All year long, over to the 54, he trained physically and he trained mentally. He trained himself mentally. I can break that barrier. I can break that four-minute mile. So in 1954, he broke the barrier. He ran the mile in three minutes, 58.8 seconds. He broke it by 1.2 seconds. One month later, now listen, one month later, Another man broke his record. Within one year, six more broke it. And within two years, 60 more. 60, 6 oh, broke it. Why? Because now they believed because Roger did it, then it's possible for us to do it too. How many of God's no respect their persons? Amen. Amen. You look around and you find the person I don't care if they're here or not, wherever they might be. You find the person that you look up to the most, they're the most spiritual person. I mean, they are blessed going out, coming in, blessed in the store, blessed in the field. They're blessed phys physically, mentally, financially. Their family's blessed. And you say, if God did it for them, he'll do it for me. Amen. 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 If they broke out of the mindset that held them back, if they broke out, then I can break out. Hallelujah. He's the God of the breakthrough. Amen. Somebody shout it out loud. He's the God of the breakthrough. And I'm going to break through every limitation in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for helping each and every one to take hold of this word and to apply it into our lives that we may truly increase more and more in every area because we want to be blessed, to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. We want to help people to get saved and healed and delivered. We want to help people, Father God, to find their place in the body, to discover the reality of who they are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.